very good morning i am dr mj azam from bangladesh scientific secretary of bangladesh society of cardiology intervention welcome you all for bsc international summit for today our event designed for divided into two part one is from the morning 9 am to 12:30 pm and second part is 5 pm to 9:30 pm i will discuss the recent advancement in technology with our various faculty from home and abroad i hope you will enjoy the whole session even though there is also a break in the lunch time and prayer time so i hope and i believe you will enjoy the whole session and this bsa initiative was our continuous commitment to development our professional activities for other scientific partners and this even chaired by our president professor akam fodur rahman sir and also our secretary general professor mr jamaluddin sir and there are separate six sessions first session is as a state of art lecture held by professor rozdi mohammad and professor tang hui chen after that there is a also stmi session in the morning session there is a award winning case competitive sessions every session every session have chair persons according to the merits of our the sessions i believe everybody we can enjoy and now i am requesting professor akam fuzur rahman sir to give his welcome speech and inaugural session after that professor mir jamaluddin sir will give a small talk very much dear friends and colleagues distinguished panelists from home and abroad so sorry for uh, technical difficulties now i am requesting professor akam uh, fuzur rahman sir to start his speech
हेलो हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग आई वेलकम यू टू ऑल इन बी डी इंटरवेंशन टोटी टोटी the virtual annual conference of bangladesh society of cardiovascular intervention in this regards i would like to express my deep condolence to professor abul husain khan choudhury dr monwar dr moin and other doctors who sacrificed their lives to save the humanity during this covid era ladies and gentlemen bangladesh society of cardiovascular intervention was established in 1st february 2003 by a group of renowned cardiologist of Bangladesh with the leadership of professor Sukhir Rahman I salute them to take such a time honored initiative for the promotion of knowledge exchange of views and skills extent of cooperation facilitate training program to enhance high standard of education in the field of interventional cardiology dear participants we along with the whole world are passing a very difficult time covid has changed our every aspect of daily life i would like to thank all heroes for their tremendous effort to save the lives during this pandemic although covid has brought changes but it is also created a scope of build solidarity among us as this time time does not permit gathering despite our enormous enthusiasm and eager to meet with each other but we cannot make the bid intervention 2020 as a live program i hope we will be met with one other in the upcoming bid intervention 2021 on mars dear participant i personally believe this virtual virtual gathering will help us to share our views knowledge and attitude we will able will be able to share interesting and challenging cases along with the updated informative lectures of our renowned national and international faculties bsci has committed to explore knowledge facilitate training programs and publish journal regularly we are working in the field of research to invent new art things we should help to the mankind now i would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to professor diman kahali professor tan Pro dr ashok shet dr nikhil parchuri dr hiramat dr rasli mahmud dr imad sabin dr sudhri hafiz ramesh dogaboti dr kaulit dr anamul akko and dr neslan and other delegates as they encouraged us by their presence despite their busy schedule bsci authority will be very much grateful to them for their continuous academic support i hope the exchange of knowledge views and skills of this auspicious memorable program would be beneficial to the interventional cardiologist as well as to the people of this country thanks to all chairperson moderators panelists faculties and vaccine co pharma for their utmost active cooperation to make the program a grand success special mm -hmm. thanks to our secretary general professor mr jamaluddin vice president mamunur rashid sizar scientific secretary professor mj azam organizing secretary uh, professor khandaka shohit husain office secretary dr nuralam all executive member dr executive member dr kajol kumar karmakar and all other yeah. members of executive committee and of this society for their cordial participation wish for a beautiful day may allah bless us khuda hafiz stay safe and blessed thank you thank you आई एम प्रोफेसर मीर जमाल
Do, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are hearing you, sir. Do you, do you hear me? Yes, sir. We are hearing you, sir. Okay. okay, thank you. <clears throat> I, uh, I am Professor Mir Jamal, Director of National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases and Secretary General of Bangladesh Society of Cardiovascular Intervention, wishing you all a good morning and assalamu alaikum today's uh, our, our program uh, is our uh, international uh, program and in every year since the inception of this uh, bangladesh society of cardiovascular intervention there is a, um, a national conference and every alternate year there is an international conference and in this year it was an international conference and um, that is why uh, due to covid era we have changed it to uh, virtual uh, conference. And uh, in uh, with us, the legend internationalist of the world in this session, Professor Rosli Muhammad and Professor Tan Huisin, I wish both of you um, for uh, coming into this. We are starting the program. And and uh, our wish, BSCI is a non-political, non-profitable organization and uh, professional organization established in 1st February 2003 by uh, Professor Subhiya Rahman. And at uh, 1st uh, February 2003, and they, uh, there was a meeting and in that meeting, Professor Subhiya Rahman was the um, president, ad hoc president of this Bangladesh Society of Cardiovascular Intervention and it started its journey from that day. And what are the aims and objectives of BSCI? Promotion of the knowledge and expertise among the interventional cardiologists of Bangladesh to raise the standard of intervention practice for better management of cardiac patients. Promotion of cooperation and communication with the national and international organizations in the field of intervention and allied principles. To organize training course and continuing medical education program for the members of the society and other young doctors. And <clears throat> to organize scientific seminars and workshop. Uh, it is routine uh, procedure uh, from this BSCI, but due to this COVID era, this year we are a bit behind. To publish journal newsletter on interventional cardiology and distribute the journal or newsletter among the members of the society and interested persons. To promote participation of members of the society in national and international conferences, training programs on interventional uh, cardiology and allied discipline, and to establish and uh, enunciate high standard of education and training in the field of interventional cardiology. And these uh, are the members of my um, uh, society, that is Executive Community Society. There are 288 or 84 members out of which uh, this 27 is the Executive Committee members. And uh, all of us uh, almost are with us now in connection. So uh, I was time to um, for, for this. We have already um, lo, uh, 10, 10 to 15 minutes behind. And present members is 286, life memory 144, and general member 142. And journals, recently one journal uh, published and scientific activity as per academic year calendar, annual scientific conference, uh, BD intervention, national fellow course, and international congress in February. Every year, and research fund 
Federation, USA, TCT, TCT AP, and other national and international organizations. And uh, this is the, uh, in nutshell, uh, my introduction to the, of the society uh, to all of you. Now I am uh, showing my gratefulness to all the members of this society who has, uh, who has uh, given tremendous time and pain uh, to make it success. And I am also grateful to the foreign faculties. That is also for the time schedule. I do not uh, uh, tell their name. And I am uh, telling that uh, all over the world, uh, of different countries, approximately 20 entologists are and he will give the thank you thank you Mr. Jamal, sir uh, for his nice excellent presentation and overview of these activities now i am requesting our moderator and chairpersons and uh, panelists get ready to for exciting events now i am requesting the, our first session state of art lecture the chair is the, <coughs> this session is chaired by Professor Ekam Fuzlur Rahman and Professor Chaudhary H. Asan. I think everybody is here. And I am requesting Professor Mir Jamaluddin sir and Dr. Moshin Ahmed, please moderate the session and please continue the session. Thank you very much. Dr. Moshin Ahmed and Professor Mir Jamaluddin, would you please moderate the session? Moshin. Okay. Dr. Moshin Ahmed. Yes, sir. good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think, sir, uh, for the permission of the chair, uh, I think uh, we can start our scientific session because we are late, late. I think 10 minutes late. Professor Fuzlawan, sir, uh, do you hear me, sir? I am hearing. Okay, okay. You are hearing every, everybody hearing. Okay. okay, we can start now. Okay, our uh, first talk by the Dr. Datuk Dr. Gusli Mama is the pioneer of university college in Malaysia, but he crosses the boundary. He is the now international figure. He also mentor of some Bangladeshi fellows. Also, uh, he is a, not only university college, but he also a good humble person and he is a good human person. So I'm requesting Dr. Rasli Muhammad, please uh, start your talk, how to run CQ program. Dr. Rasli Muhammad. Um, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, let me just share with you my uh, screen. Uh, all right. Um, you share? Stop sharing. We are seeing. Sorry, uh, let me just... Uh, Stop sharing. Share screen again. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. All right. Setting up a program. Can you see my slides now? No. No? No. Uh, okay, just along. Display setting, yeah? Yes. Now okay, we are can seeing. You see, can see? Swap. Okay. All right. Can you see it? Yes. yes sir. See, I won't hear. Now all right. Sir. So, all right. Um. Trouble lah. Yang tadi saya nak tengok sini. Okay. No. Yes. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. So thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Sorry for the. Uh, it's. I'm still grappling with uh, the Zoom. Uh, so uh, it gives me a great uh, honor, pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm sure Professor Tan will uh, say this uh, subsequently when he's uh, giving his lecture. But uh, I'm pleased to inform you that Asia PCR AICT Asia PCR has not been silent. We are going. To, we are preparing a virtual program and it's going to be a one-day uh, one program 
And hopefully, uh, if things are settled, it's going to be in early December. And the date that we have uh, at least tentatively set is on the 12th. So when it does come on board, uh, we will inform you uh, uh, in a more formal way. And uh, since AICT is a meeting of EPSIC, we will hope that uh, Bangladesh will come in and support the program. So I look forward to, uh, to December when we have the AICT Asia PCR program. So I've been tasked to um, in, uh, discuss something about setting up a CTO program. And I think uh, you probably agree that uh, with uh, CTO, it is uh, the last bastion or the final frontier for interventional cardiology because we are still learning and the success rate is, as, uh, is not as high as with the other procedures. But the uh, question is, uh, why do we need to set uh, a program? Really, uh, there must be someone who has to do the more complex uh, 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 procedures, especially in an institution. So if you have a setup, cardiology setup, very active, um, and, uh, and CTOs are cases that you will definitely see, you just need someone to actually uh, look into it and build up a CTO program. But the person who's going to set up this program must be interested in performing these procedures. Obviously, you know that uh, it realized that it takes a much longer time, higher radiation dose, higher complication rate. It is more stressful to you and your staff, especially when you do a case for, and it takes a, a long time, you get very cranky and you start to throw uh, stuff around and your staff gets the brunt of it. Financial remuneration, especially in Malaysia, is very much controlled. There's not much difference if you do a complex procedure versus a fairly straightforward procedure. So you must uh, do this as a, passion, as a passion of wanting to do these procedures. And sometimes, and it's not very uh, uncommon, you get con questionable support from your peers who may not be happy, if they're, especially if they're not involved in the program. So how do we do this? Uh, I feel that you need to choose the best person to perform this procedure. It may not be the head of department or the most senior person, but uh, if you have a senior person or head department, he or she can lead the program. But to do the procedures itself, you need someone who's interested, who's most skillful, who's most interested and who's most innovative. Obviously, if it's well received by his colleagues, it will be better because you need to have some people to refer to you the complex cases. Preferably, I feel at least two physicians should be on board and not just one single person. And uh, you need to have appropriate support given by the department to lead the program, appropriate referral, as I mentioned, training, including bringing in doctors and budget allocation for the devices because they are, a lot of devices may need to be utilized and the, these are more costly than the normal devices that you use in the normal uh, uh, PCI procedures. Now, uh, but when a person is uh, uh, leading the program, obviously I would suggest that you have, uh, you start cases and choose your cases very well with clear objectives in mind you would definitely want to ensure that you get appropriate and indicated persons, patients, because if you are doing cases which are not appropriate, you will face uh, uh, criticism by your peers. Uh, you must understand that uh, when you want to do CTOs, it is mainly involving a vessel involving a large territory of jeopardized myocardium. The myocardium must be viable and preferably uh, demonstrated, uh, demonstrating ischemia in the area that you want to treat. Now, the clinications uh, is to alleviate symptoms, to improve LV function, and of course, to improve survival in the end. So if you, are, you choose your cases very well, you will get benefits from all these uh, 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 objectives. Um, and when you want to start a program, the person who's doing it will have to be equipped with knowledge and skills. You need to read, you need to learn about your devices, you, meet, you need to play about with it and be Make sure that uh, you utilize the devices appropriately, observe live cases, participate in workshops, working with proctors. And it is also very important that you need to train your staff. Uh, so they need to be together with you. Then it, it makes things so much easier because you don't have to think that much. They will be in line with you and will be there to support you. Choose your cases very well. Obviously, to start off with, you don't want to start with the most difficult or challenging cases, but you build it up as you go along. 
you need to learn anti-grade before retrograde to me. Uh, but uh, once you feel ready and uh, if the channels, uh, collateral channels are suitable, then you can carry on and start your retrograde technique. Planning to me is very important. You don't have to stage uh, your PCIs every time, especially when you have a simple and straightforward uh, cases. But when it comes to more complex cases, cases that have been attempted and failed, these are cases that you need to look carefully at the uh, images and then you think about how you're going to plan your strategy and technique. So this is an example of a patient that's fairly straightforward to me, a severe CTO, uh, retrograde filling and uh, the CTO is not very long and uh, you can actually use a simple wire and uh, you know, and wiring is something is very important because you need to shape it properly and you need to have this feel. Uh, and uh, once you have done that, uh, you will be able to cross. And this is a fairly straightforward uh, case of a CTO. Now, I would uh, emphasize that careful assessment of CTO and its features are important because you want to determine the technique and strategy. Uh, you can also assess what is a possible success rates and hopefully over time, this will improve you would also be able to anticipate the complication and its risks of performing the procedure. And at the same time, importantly, you need to estimate the procedural cost. Because remember, even though you like uh, for every case to be successful, you know that in CTO, you may fail and, uh, and you have to think about subsequent treatment. If you're going to reattempt or send the patients for bypass, it adds on to cost. Your initial procedures add to, uh, to cost. And if a patient can afford the procedure, you may even want to consider bypass surgery, for example, if it's indicated. Uh, I would uh, say that the, with regards to strategy and technique, you sometimes may require more information from other imaging. Uh, for example, a CT angiogram. I will give an example of a CT angiogram uh, and its uh, evaluation in terms of uh, uh, treating CTOs. You need uh, to know the devices and equipment that you require. You need to ask yourself, are you the right person to do it? Do you need the help of a more experienced colleague and also a proctor? Those are some other things that you need to consider. There are a number of things that I want to emphasize in, and this is not a lecture about techniques uh, because it's about setting a program, but I just want to emphasize the fact that if you do a CTO, generally speaking, almost all patients would require a dual or bilateral injection. So I, I believe it's very important because I've seen a lot of patients, uh, people doing CTOs, they don't see the distal vessel, but they just to do integrate without a, a, a contralateral injection, not knowing which space they are when the wire goes through, whether it's inside the true lumen or outside uh, uh, in the wall or even outside the, the vessel. So this is very important. Now, the, this is a case of dual injection, looking from the left, injecting, and you can see the CTO on the right side. Now, the second thing that is very important to me, even though it's basic, is that the appropriate guide catheter is very important because, you know, uh, the young ones don't, don't, sometimes don't realize how important a guide catheter is in complex uh, PCI. All the more so for CTOs. When you have CTO, you need good guide support. It's not just the stents which are easy to go down in and, and so on, but really a guide support, appropriate and good guide support is important to try to ensure that you are more successful. If the guide is poor, when you push in the wire, the guide gets kicked out, change the guide. So start early rather than late before you say, oh, this guide is not good, and then you choose a proper guide. So remember, appropriate guide catheter is very important. Now, you must, of course, be well-versed with the devices and its techniques. And uh, there are lots of PCI tools that are available that uh, will be required in, the, uh, uh, in your quest of performing uh, PCI. And as you go and do more and more cases, you realize that uh, there are certain equipment that you need to have. And it's good to have this equipment on the shelf because when you need it, it is there. Okay? You don't want to... You want a, 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 a successful PCI. Now, obviously, you need to learn how to use them correctly. You know, a lot of things uh, about guide and the other things which are the specialty guide wires are very important. There are lots of specialty guide wires. Try to, uh, you know, be comfortable with uh, a number of them because in the end, when you want to start a case, you'll be choosing one or two guides that you feel is suitable 
for the procedure. So you have to be familiar with the guides. So essentially, these are some of different uh, uh, properties of different kinds of guides, guide wires. But really, what is more important is learn to how to shape them and learn how to use them. Remember, for example, if you're using uh, Confianza or Conquest Pro, the wires are so stiff. Sometimes you don't even realize that it is not in the true lumen. It's inside the vessel wall, but it, it, it appears and feels as if it is in the true lumen. And you find out it's not in the true lumen. So once again, you need to understand all these uh, wires, the, the ones that you're going to use them. CT guided planning for PCI, they are not uh, usually used, uh, but in a number of cases, sometimes it is important and they add on value to uh, your cases. For example, this is a patient who has an ambiguous uh, uh, CTO, this uh, ambiguous stump. This is an LED, which is severely stenosed. This is clearly diagonal. You can see the LED. And you don't really know where the, the CTO is coming from. I think it's most likely ar around here but you're not really sure. So a CT would help. Uh, I'm just showing you this 3D image, uh, but of course your uh, definition or rather your assessment will be on the MPR. Uh, and in this case, you just, uh, just to show you that uh, there is a point where it is uh, totally included and you can see that it's somewhere around here. So in cases like this uh, for us, uh, we predilated and uh, you can see it's probably coming from around there. And that CT actually aligns it and you're going to try to wire somewhere around that area. And uh, we use, uh, I, I use a double human catheter with a Conquest Pro and target it at a point that uh, we felt uh, it was coming out. And, uh, and uh, with a double human catheter, it helps to stabilize the catheter and allow the wire to pass through and then it's uh, in the true human. Now, it is also important, this is just to remind me to also tell you that when you are, you think that you are in the true lumen, always check in two different views. Because if you don't uh, check in two different views, you think that in one view it, you are in, but in another view it is not. So remember always, if you feel that you're in, check in two different views to ensure that it is really in the distal true lumen. And most times or not, this is uh, uh, determined by a contralateral injection. So that's where the dual injection comes into play. There are various uh, uh, algorithm or techniques in terms of doing CTO-PCI. Uh, this is a simplified hybrid algorithm. You have a dual catheter uh, angiography, and then you see whether the uh, proximal cap is clear or and the distal target is good, because if yes, then you're going to think about anti-grade. If it's not, then you think about retrograde. And of course, then the assessment will be about the length. If the length is shorter, and why escalation, if the length is longer, then you use a more uh, complex uh, technique uh, or procedure. So this is a fairly simplified algorithm and you, someone who's uh, doing the program would have to understand this algorithm. It is not as simple as it is because the Asia Pacific CTO Club has uh, detailed it out more uh, in their um, assessment uh, and uh, you can obtain this on the net, but really it is something that as you go along, you build and uh, once you are more familiar with the uh, techniques, you will be able to immediately divide into in your mind, I will go integrate or retrograde, I will go wire escalation or I would go a direct anterior, uh, direct re-entry uh, approach. So all those things are very important. It is also very important to note that uh, you want to try as much as possible to be successful but you must also remember that sometimes, and you must know this, it's very important to know that you must know when to stop, especially if you've done a long time and you're not making any progress, if they're using a lot of contrast. And remember, radiation comes into play. So it is very important for you to set your radiation uh, dose uh, and uh, therefore you limit your radiation and you will have to stop if it has gone on to a much uh, higher dose that is given to the patient. So the other important thing when you want to start a program is that do not be deterred from re-attempt. You may fail the first time, but uh, don't say that if you fail, it's not going to be successful the second time. This is an example of a patient that, was, uh, uh, that had a CTO procedure done in a different hospital. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no contralateral uh, injection being done. Uh, in the end, uh, they, sorry, uh, in the end, uh, there's uh, the, Procedure was not successful in, in sub-intimal. 
uh, but uh, and it has actually extended the CTO extended right until the PR branch. So the patient was referred much later, and uh, it was reattempted at six months. And you can see from the contralateral injection, the vessel has healed, and the CTO is only for short, uh, 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 you know, uh, length. And this is something that you can reattempt. So this is a case uh, which is now fairly short. Um, and uh, this is just with the soft wire, got it until right until the mid segment and it was then crossed with a filter wire. So once again, do not be deterred if you fail. It doesn't mean that uh, it cannot be done. You, have, you can still do it, uh, but you need to think about, uh, you know, uh, firstly, you allow the vessel to heal. And if you feel that it's not going to be successful, you already thought about a different technique to be done. Proctorship, yes, sometimes you need to call in uh, some help to uh, invite some people to come in to help you with your program. To me, there are three stages of invitation. Uh, I usually, when it's a more complex uh, procedures and it's a new procedure, for example, I would call them to start off uh, your program in the very beginning. And the second stage is that uh, you feel that uh, you have done enough, but you have failed in more complex lesion cases than you uh, collect them and bring another person to help you learn new techniques and the use of devices. And last but not least, after you've done quite a number, you might sometimes call uh, your colleagues, your friends or another proctor to benchmark yourselves and see how well you are doing as compared to the other people. So other more experienced people. So these are the stages of proctorship that you may want to consider. But really in the end, once you have done enough, I feel strongly that you should go out and proctor yourselves, proctor others. Because to me, you have a responsibility to teach and train, train others. And by doing so, you allow more patients to be treated. And when you do cases, the more you do cases, the more you learn at the same time. So please think about teaching others when you're more proficient. Uh, I, I, I feel that uh, a regular audit is very important because uh, you learn from every case, even the successful ones or the ones, especially the ones who fail. You need to learn how to improve further and uh, re-attempt and which technique to attempt because you want in the end to have a much higher success rate with low complication rate, a quicker and sh or shorter procedure time and a less costly procedure. So the better you are, the more, uh, you, know, uh, the, uh, you know, the rates and the success rates will be much uh, better. And you need to analyze all your complications and audit your results. And you should share your results with the others to gain confidence from your colleagues that they will be able to send refer patients to you. Now, you, to me, I feel strongly that you must have the right frame approach. You need to plan with only success in mind. There should not be any half attempts. I mean, let me try, you know, when you have a, a simple, that's fine. But when you have more complex lesions and you feel that you're not up to it, you need to think about asking your colleagues to help or referring cases. So only accept cases that you can perform successfully. You must know your limits. Uh, and you need to uh, make sure that you plan the strategy well. So right frame of approach, which is planning with only success in mind. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, um, setting up proper CTO program is essential, especially in a cardiac institution. You need to have uh, the right person to lead and you need to support them when your program is up and running. The one who's leading must train the staff well and equip uh, uh, themselves with knowledge and skills have the proper devices made available, plan the procedure well, and know the various techniques. Do not give up easily. So obviously you need someone who is a bit more persistent in doing uh, these cases, but you must always has, have not just success in mind, but you must always have safety in your mind. Think always how to improve oneself, audit your results, and you must continue to teach others. So I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, this is my small hospital in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, I hope uh, we can see some of you when you come over to Malaysia. So thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Your excellent, sir, elaborate, sir, discussion on training program, how to set up the CTO program. Uh, I am requesting Dr. Chaudhary S. Hassan. Uh, you, are, you are the son of the soil in Bangladesh. Like developing country in Bangladesh, how you set up in CTO program? So because of financial crisis, we have you know, the insurance coverage of the uh, people. How will you uh, initiate the CTO program in the, our government hospital? Dr. Chaudhary Hassan, do you hear me? Yeah, 
Um, yeah. That's a great question. And I really um, thank uh, Professor Rosli Mahmoud to share his experience and um, the word of wisdom, how to set up a program. And it is really challenging. Um, and I cannot uh, thank you all as I uh, make frequent trips to Bangladesh and learn the experience and how much difficulties you go through and a uh, lot of constraints you face. In the middle of that, it is really um, amazing to me to see that some of you are actually trying to set up a CTO program. Uh, we need to have that uh, passion and we need to have that technique all the time in the world. When we started the program, I tell even my junior colleagues that better, I usually do it when the day I am off because I don't want to do this in a day that uh, I have to run for the clinic and I have a one o'clock clinic, you know, and then I have two CTOs schedule and I just have a tendency to abort and then it's not a good thing. So, um, and then the financial part is important. In the US, we don't feel that much, but I think you have to go through a lot. So I'm not the best person to ask this question because I really amazed to see the, how you even uh, dare to set up a program in a financially resource wise and logistic wise constrained area like Bangladesh. But whoever is doing it and I see that and I, I congratulate you, I salute you every time, every time I see that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Asan Bhai. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Fuzulaman, sir, another chairperson. Uh, our start with CTO program. Uh, we get the BCI, uh, how the BCI helps the government hospital to set up this program, junior training. How your uh, objectives of the BCI? And Professor Fuzulaman, do you? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, yes. uh, Dr. Mohsin. Uh, also, thanks to Professor Rusli Mahmood. He elaborately outlined give the outline of uh, CTO setup in a hospital. Actually, in the scenario of Bangladesh, now our services, I think it is up to the international level. We have so many centers in Bangladesh, and we have also renowned cardiologists in our Bangladesh. Is the problem is that we have to take the initiative how we can set up a CTO program, especially giving emphasis on the case selection hardware and uh, stand selection and expertise. We have to make the expertise because our junior fellows, they are very much interested in this fact. So we are the cardiologists, but we are the faculties of Bangladesh. It is our duty to make a CTO program by utilizing our younger fellows. That will be beneficial for, the, for them as well as for my country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Rosli, do you hear me? Uh, one question from the our panelist: uh, How much you try for integrate before going to the retrograde? How much time you trying for integrate approach? Yeah. I, I mean, there's the there's not a fixed number that you can say, but obviously you want to be doing integrate first. Uh, you know, you need to be familiar with the uh, wires and overcome that. Uh, but if you once you are comfortable with doing that and you find that uh, you know you handle especially the microcatheters uh, well then uh, you may want to start retrograde. And of course, retrograde, you look uh, for uh, a good uh, septal channel. Uh, and you know, to start off with, you need to feel the wires, uh, the wiring, and also the, the microcatheters. So there is no fixed uh, amount, a number. But once you've done, you're quite comfortable about doing integrates, then uh, you may want to uh, decide uh, to go retrograde. And you have to choose your case as well. The simple ones first. Thank you, sir. Actually, actually Actually, in considering the CTO intervention, usually most of the experience of order in the world, they are first choice in the integrate. But if, as we know, the proximal distal cap is very soft and we can easily penetrate from the distal. So some of our uh, experienced person, they are taking the retrograde in certain situation. Actually, choice of procedure is the integrate one is the first. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, Doctor, uh, Professor Mr. Jamal, sir, do you hear me, sir? Do you add something? Do you add something, sir? Professor Mr. Jamal, sir.
Okay, we can go to the second talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sri Mamad. Your fine uh, 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 guideline for the for like Bangladesh, where people are benefited from your lecture. We can set up our center in situ. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Tanu Chim, uh, he, he is known very much uh, known to Bangladesh. He's a good friend of Bangladesh. Uh, he's not only Singapore. He's crosses the boundary. He's the one of the one of the best organizer I ever seen. Uh, welcome in Bangladesh, Professor Tanu Chim. He will talk on PCI in STMICS. Current evidence and studies. Dr. Dr. Danny Chim, welcome in Bangladesh and to this talk. We're going to start now. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. You hear me? And you can see the slide as well. Yes, nicely. Assalamu alaikum and Abhikam uh, Anjan. And thank you very much for this privilege to speak at the ESCI International Webinar. And this is a topic that I've been assigned PCI and SEMI ACS current evidence and strategy. This is a huge topic, but I'll try to finish it within the 15 minutes of sign. We know that the treatment of uh, patients with acute myocardial infarction is time sensitive. There's this concept here of time is muscle and muscle is like. And we know that uh, there is a golden hours of treatment for patients with acute myocardial infarction with regard to a reduction in mortality. If you look at the uh, chart here, the golden hours is within the first three hours of acute myocardial infarction, where you have a significant reduction of mortality when you intervene. And once you hit uh, beyond 12 hours, the mortality curve is pretty much flat, suggesting that there's not much of a benefit, even if you were to reperfuse the patient's uh, myocardium. And this is because of this wavefront phenomena of its self death, which we know nearly about 30 years ago. The proportion of its ischemic heart muscle, which is viable and potentially salvageable, is a function of the time after coronary occlusion. Meaning to say that we, we occlude the artery, the first part of the heart muscle that dies, the endocardium, and then it migrates in a wavefront fashion with time to involve the myocardium as well as the epicardium following and, and finally resulting in a full thickness uh, myocardial infarction. So time is a, a key here. And for a long time, we've been arguing uh, which is better. Is it uh, pharmacologic reperfusion or is it primary mechanical uh, reperfusion like we call a primary angioplasty? And I think we all have a uh, answer to that questions with this meta-analysis published by Keeley, which is very well coded, 2003 10 in this particular meta-analysis, you can see clearly that when you perform primary PCI, there is a significant reduction of death. Whether a patient has got cardiogenic shock or no cardiogenic shock, there is a significant reduction in non-fatal myocardial infarction, significant reduction in stroke, and significant reduction in hemorrhagic uh, stroke as well. So we know that now primary PCI has many advantages. It actually established much better superior vessel patency and TB3 flow rates compared to pharmacologic therapy. It's got a reduced V occlusion rate, reduced rate of a recurrent ischemic event, shorter length of hospital stays, allows for reperfusion even when, uh, when there's lytics contraindicated. But I think importantly also is that it provides an early definition of the coronary anatomy and which allows for our therapy to be subsequently tailored and re-stratifications to be performed. So these are the advantages of a primary PCI. And we also know from at least uh, four different randomized clinical trials that even if a patient has got, uh, were admitted to a hospital without a PCI capability, if you transfer a patient to another hospital versus giving the patients on-site tumoralytic therapy, you continue to reap the benefit of a primary PCCI, PDCA in patients with acute myocardial infarction. So it is okay to transfer if you do have a system network within the, your vicinity. I just want to cover the topic here uh, in these five areas, which inclu includes devices, hemodynamic support, pharmacology, controversy, as well as cardiogenic shock, which really marks some of the latest uh, evidence as well as uh, thoughts uh, with regard to STEMI management. Now, in terms of uh, devices, uh, it is quite clear. 
that drug eluding stand is superior to bare metal stand. In this meta analysis of randomized controlled trial, you can see that everything uh, shifts to the left when we use uh, DS. So DS uh, gives you a lower definite of probable stand thrombosis. It gives you a lower rate of target vessel revascularization and lower maze at three years. But there was no significant reduction in the overall and cardiac mortality. But with this advantage, it's good enough to use DES in almost all our cases. And what about radio access? There have been so many uh, trials comparing trans radio versus trans femoral in patients with percutane or in patients with STEMI undergoing primary PCI. And I think this meta analysis again sums up the uh, data that we know that it can actually reduce all cause mortality. It reduces major bleeding, particularly the vascular excess bleeding. So why trans radio access can reduce in all cause mortality, nobody really knows. But I think the fact that you reduce bleeding complication, you reduce the likelihood of a patient having to discontinue its antiplatelet therapy because of bleeding, perhaps may have contributed to the overall benefit of survival. The second part is we talk about the hemodynamic support. Increasingly, when you have very unstable patients, you now have to rely on a variety of hemodynamic supports. And this is a snapshot of what are some of the mechanical circulatory support devices that are available. I think most of us are very familiar with IBP, but we also know that IBP has significant uh, uh, limitations. The cardiac output is actually very limited, probably one liter at most of uh, of, uh, of uh, improved uh, outflow uh, with the IBP. Plus IBP we know is a passive afterload reductor, so it's not very useful. Impeller on the other hand is an active uh, afterload reductor. It so it sucks the uh, blood from the LV into the aorta and helps to unload the heart. Tandem heart has, requires you to do a trans uh, septal puncture through the interatrial septum. This is not likely to be practical in our uh, in our daily practice. So I think tandem heart is not going to be big time. And ECMO is of course the, the most uh, uh, resource intensive and probably the most uh, intense uh, 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 in terms of cost as well as uh, uh, you know, resource commitment. So this is a uh, patient with impeller. So uh, impeller actually will be something that is easily picked up by our operator. You just do a pretty much like a LV uh, gram pick deal. You just uh, thread along this wire that you put in the LV and just put this uh, impeller catheter inside it. So uh, the trouble with this uh, use of this device is that it's very expensive. Right now it costs about $36,004 to put in one of this uh, uh, device in our patients. Of course, MO is the other uh, therapy that is available nowadays as we develop ourselves to be a cardiogenic shock center. Every patient who requires cardiogenic shock is now managed by a bounty disciplinary team, including all sorts of devices that we may uh, potentially commit to just saving his life. The third aspect of our STEMI management I want to talk about is pharmacology. And indeed, now we have a newer novel P2I12 inhibitors that we should consider giving to our patients with at the elevations myocardial infarction. And I'm specifically referring to Prosegro, which is proven in the Trident DME38, whether it's a primary PCI or secondary PCI. Secondary PCI is referred uh, defined as AMI occurring more than 12 hours. In terms of reduction of primary efficacy endpoint at 30 days, there was a significant benefit with the use of Prosegro. But we also understand that Prosegro has a number of limitations. It is not used in people who are elderly, more than age of 75. It is not used in people who are underweight, less than 60 years old, and not used in people with a history of stroke called TIA. The other drug that we now commonly use is, so, uh, is, uh, is this drug called Ticagulo. And Plato uh, trial, uh, tells us that uh, this drug is uh, useful in patients with ACS. Although specifically looking at the primary PCI, the, uh, the uh, uh, P, uh, P value was 0 0.07, but the benefit is really consistent with the overall Plato trial results. And as a result, uh, we now use uh, Ticagulo and all Prospero as our standard drug. Therapy. And indeed, this is supported by the ESC recommendations that tells us that you should use a the P2Y12 inhibitors, Prosoglo or Ticagulo, unless otherwise contraindicated uh, or because of increased risk of bleeding. So this is a class one recommendations. 
I want to touch on some controversy in primary PCI. So specifically, there's two areas here. One is the role of aspiration thrombectomy, and secondly, is the uh, strategy of a culprit versus multivessel uh, PCI in the patients with AMI. Now, I, we know that even with our best treatment uh, using primary PCI, you will find that half of your patients don't actually have complete ST segment resolution. And this is quite well known from before. And uh, why is it that after reperfusing the R3, there is still no complete ST segment uh, resolution? Moreover, we also know that if you look at some of the uh, uh, rest, uh, uh, cine pictures, you find that the myocardial blush may actually vary in different group of patients. Certainly, we know now that there is a situation where you have TMP grade zero, where there's absolutely no myocardial perfusion at all, or you have TMP grade one, where the, uh, the contrast pretty much stay in the myocardium, or TMP three, which is the uh, the ground glass appearance that, uh, that we will expect in a normal perfusion state. When you have impaired perfusion at the microvascular level, you have a higher mortality. So even if you open up the epicardial coronary artery, it's not going to change the patient's prognosis. And the main reasons for this impaired myocardial perfusion at the microvascular level are many, but I think the chief importance uh, cause will be a thrombus uh, embolization. And this is the rationale uh, for thrombectomy. Because when you have a primary PCI, you cause your instrumentations cause a disruption of the thrombus and they all go migrate down, embolize, and result in a poor flow in the distal vasculature. So by performing aspiration thrombectomy, you may reduce embolization and improve the patient's clinical outcomes. And we actually have a trial called TAPAS trial which was done earlier on and tells us that there is a significant reduction in death and reinfarction in favor of the group that had selected thrombectomy. Unfortunately, this trial was not corrobor corrobor corroborated by subsequent study. Tate's trial tells us that 30 days and one year, there was no difference in all cause mortality with a reduced uh, routine thrombus aspiration strategy. And this is also supported by the total trial where again, a trial of routine aspiration thrombectomy did not show an improvement in terms of clinical outcomes of reduced death, MI shock or class 4 heart failure in patients who receive uh, therapy. So both Tate and Total pretty much tell us that routine thrombectomy is not the way to go. And indeed, this is the recommendations by 2017 ESC guidelines for STEMI, which gives a class three recommendations for routine thrombus aspirations. But I have a problem in terms of the interpretation of this data, because in all this trial, particularly the total trial, it was a strategy of routine thrombectomy. It was not a strategy of selective thrombectomy. And we obviously know when you have a very small little bit of thrombus, any form of routine thrombectomy is not going to change a lot. But when you have a huge thrombus or you have a large vessel which is occluded, clearly selective thrombectomy must have some kind of role, although we have never been able to prove it. Secondly, in the total trial, there were some patients who were randomized to the uh, non thrombectomy but actually subsequently underwent a build-up thrombectomy. So we don't know what is the role of build-up thrombectomy at this point in time. Plus, the thrombectomy arm have a higher incidence of stroke in, in the total trial. Is this a technique problem with regard to aspiration thrombectomy? So my take here is that in your daily clinical practice, when you have little or no thrombus, you can just simply do a direct standing. When you have mild to moderate thrombus, perhaps some kind of aspiration catheter will still be helpful. And when you have a large thrombus, surely you have to do something about it. And uh, when you have large thrombus, uh, we prefer to use an uh, angiojet uh, thrombectomy system, uh, which is really quite nice when you uh, pass this particular catheter through. There are water jets coming out from three holes, and this disrupts the thrombus, and there's a suction cutter as well. It sucks the thrombus inside this uh, lumen as well as shearing it with this cutter blade, and that really can significantly reduce the uh, thrombus load in the artery. The second controversy in the primary PCI is this concept of a culprit versus multivessel PCI in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. Now, we all know that to do a multivessel PCI in a STEMI setting, there are pros and cons. The pro is that you, it is safe to do. Uh, you can reduce hospital stay. You don't have to come back again for a re-intervention. You can lower risk of reinfarction. 
But the con is that uh, you're going to increase for zero time. There's a radiation involved and there's also contrast involved. Frequently, you are unable to estimate the size of the stenosis and so on and so forth. So there are pros and cons in doing a direct multi battle PCI. So there have been at least 10 trials randomizing two strategies here. One is just do a culprit lesion and one is to do all the lesions at the same time in patients with multivascular coronary artery disease. And when we look at the meta-analysis, let's look at what we find. Uh, there was no significant difference in all cause mortality, but we do know that when you do a, a multivascular PCI in the stage fashion, there's a lower risk for reinfarction, cardiovascular mortality, and repeat revascularization, but no major bleeding difference or difference. So there are advantages in doing multi-vessel PCI. Uh, multi so let's look at the 2013 uh, ACC recommendation. It is a class 2B recommendation for patients with non-infarct artery uh, who has got the multi-vessel coronary artery gene disease, so you don't try to do them. It's class 2B. The evidence is not so strong, but ESC actually gave a class 2A of uh, recommendation for patients who have uh, non-infarct related artery lesions treated at the same time before hospital discharge. So the question here is not whether we should be doing a multi-battle revascularization. I think we should. The question here is when, but not whether we should be doing a multi lesion, a PCI. The conservative management of the non-infarct related artery clearly is not good enough based on the current evidence. What is unanswered in all this trial is that we still don't know whether we should do it immediately or we can stage it, whether in hospital or at an outpatient. Whether we should do it during hospitalization or after 30 days, how do we re-stratify in terms of complexity of the disease? Should we have proof evidence of ischemia and what sort of a patient-specific decisions that we have to make? So complete revascularization, in my opinion, should not be routinely performed at the same time of an AMI, but rather you have to assess the patients based on his uh, lesion as well as clinical profile. Finally, I just want to cover a little bit on cardiogenic shock and STEMI. Uh, we all know that when you have cardiogenic shock, your mortality can go very high in the region of about 50 percent. And we also you know that when you have IBP, uh, it is not very useful in the saving lives. IBP from one and two tells us that there is no significant improvement in hemodynamics or survival. We also know that in the in a cardiogenic shock, you just need to treat only the culprit lesions and leave the rest of the other arteries alone because uh, in terms of all cause mortality and the likelihood of a patient requiring renal replacement therapy is lower if you just treat the culprit lesions. So no need to treat all the lesions in the patients with a, uh, a myocardial infarction complicated by cardiogenic shock. What is, has changed in the last two to three years is this whole concept of a cardiogenic shock center. It is no longer good enough to do uh, to transfer patients to a PCI capable hospital. We want to transfer patients or be managed patients, perhaps preferably in a PCI capable at the same time is a cardiogenic shock center where it is fully equipped. So this is the best scenario. In fact, if you are admitted to a patient, you are admitted to a hospital which is PCI capable, but non-shock uh, stroke uh, center, Perhaps in a patient with cardiogenic shock, you might want to transfer after communicating with a doctor or the team from a cardiogenic shock center. And this is the things that have been shown in the last two to three years that have now significantly transformed the survival chance of a patient with acute myocardial infarction. That now in a cardiogenic shock center, this will be what is being performed in their respective centers. So if you want to call yourself a cardiogenic shock center, you must be capable of doing the following thing. You have a system of rapid identification and triage for the sickest of patients. You have a system where interventional cardiologists are consulted. You need to have a whole variety of mechanical circulatory support systems in your uh, center, Impeller, IBP, ECMO, and so forth. You will only do as a strategy a uh, PCI of the corporate lesion. Systematically, you will put in a pulmonary artery catheter to do a right heart pressure measurement, and you will use the hemodynamics 
to decide on whether to escalate or de-escalate the use of vasopressors and iso, uh, inotropes, uh, or whether to keep the current level of uh, mechanical circulatory support, or you have to escalate the level of mechanical circulatory support. And you want to involve a multidisciplinary heart team. So in my center now, anybody will kind of come in a cardiogenic show, at least three different doctors will be looking after him. One will be the interventional cardiologist, one will be the intensive care cardiologist, and the third one will be the cardiothoracic surgeons coming in as a team to decide on what is the best course of action for this patient and to escalate care as quickly if necessary. And finally, you need to have a setup of a good intensive care unit to manage this high-risk group of patients with cardiogenic shock. So in conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think with regard to uh, STEMI management, the current evidence and strategy, I think primary PCR, as we all know, is truly a life-saving procedure. In fact, it is the best uh, scenario to apply a PCI uh, technique. The management of a primary PCI, I think, should be based on sound evidence derived from well-conducted clinical trials whenever possible. But even with the best sound evidence and best clinical trials, we still have to sometimes uh, interpret the result and apply the treatment in a manner that will take into account the clinical circumstances and resources. As in all primary PCI or as in all uh, PCI situations, it calls for three values from the from the team. One is the skill of the operator, two is his judgment, and finally, his experience. And all these three elements will count in the final survival chance of a patient with STEMI. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. excellent talk, sir. Uh, you covered every aspect of STMI from the start to from the shock trial. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry uh, Isasan, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, in Bangladesh, uh, in primary PCI, we are already only a single digit, touch around a single digit. The possible in Bangladesh is uh, more popular in primary PCI because less number of cath labs, uh, you know a lot of shock shock patients, continuing shock patients. So in case of primary uh, pharmacogen visit therapy, regarding pharmacogen visit therapy, popular in Bangladesh, I think it should be done pharmacogen visit therapy. Do you tell something about the pharmacogen visit therapy? Uh, no, I have not covered pharmacoinvasive therapy, uh, simply because uh, it is something that is not done in Singapore, because we are not a very big country, we are very small. So every, every patient, every citizen is within 20 to 30 minutes of a hospital. So there's no need to give any sort of pharmacologic therapy. And all the public hospitals in Singapore are capable of performing primary PCI. But where there is a expensive uh, territory and where the uh, uh, proximity is a problem, pharmacoinvasive approach, I think, is a very reasonable strategy for a big country like uh, Bangladesh or India and so forth. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, I will. I will tell you yeah. that I yeah. am in Nevada, and we, the state of Nevada, the other than Las Vegas and Reno, the whole state is very remote. So we we actually. Uh, analysis and a large number of patients did not get any therapy and the mortality was really high. So we actually took the initiative and then expedite how to do the pharmacoinvasive approach. So whatever I learned from Bangladesh, I'm actually using here. It's the other way around. <laughs> Very good. Uh, thank you. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Uh, Professor Tan, uh, thank you very much. Actually, primary PCI uh, is very much helpful and life-saving, but sometimes when primary PCI is not possible within uh, 12 or 24 hours, even thrombolysis is failed or thrombolysis could not be given, then what a patient is otherwise stable, acute MI patient. What is the earliest time for intervention on this patient? Is it in the same hospital setting or after one month? Well, yeah. I think that if the patient has got the STEMI and that you have not treated him uh, within that timely period of uh, 12 hours, uh, there will be a significant necrosis uh, occurring, so much so that I feel that subsequent intervention is not going to change very much. But if the patient has got a spontaneous reperfusions following his STEMI, I will do his uh, 
angiogram as soon as possible uh, so that uh, I don't have to face this chance of a reocclusion or recurrent ischemia occurring, as we know, very high in about 25% of patients with spontaneous reperfusion. So I'll do it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You would add that this uh, issue about post-infarct angina can be another uh, reason to go after. And then, Professor uh, uh, Ten uh, Chima already mentioned that it goes in a wave front from phenomena. We know that, but it is important that you know we don't let the patient go into or trial <laughs> enrollment. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yes. because if it's like three days and 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 done deal, okay. then there is no point in going after. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Big Jamal, sir. Do you hear me, sir? Professor. Hi. Yes, I am here. Yes, Professor Tan Museum, you have very nicely and elaborately described uh, the management of ST uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, mute yourself. I am requesting to mute yourself. Uh, in your country, Dr. Tan, um, in your country, all patients uh, is included within primary PCA, but that is not possible in developing countries like Bangladesh, India, as because uh, due to several reasons, one is socioeconomic condition, another is traffic jam in the city, all together uh, pull back from the uh, primary PCA. And in that case, uh, we are, uh, what we are doing, that is pharmacoinvasive. Uh, uh, that is pharmacoinvasive, and by this pharmacoinvasive, we are getting good results, though there is no, uh, not yet published uh, data, but we have the data, and that uh, pharmacoinvasive is uh, good, not better than primary PCA, never, but it is good, as because now the uh, latest uh, uh, thrombolytics is also available, and so, uh, our um, uh, vessel becomes almost uh, timid to timid three flow after uh, within 24 hours, though it is essential for within half an hour or <laughs> within two hours, according to the uh, according to the guideline, we should do it by two hours. If not possible, then we should go for uh, <clears throat> thrombolytics and subsequently we are doing, dealing with uh, pharma. What uh, just uh, be, just my uh, before my question, they they also uh, told uh, he also asked. Uh, regarding uh, pharmacoinvasive, then I want to know from you whether pharmacoinvasive is a good alternative of primary PCI in the uh, special cases or not. Oh, I, I completely agree. Whether this pharmacoinvasive... I think it's a wonderful strategy. Whether this... Where if yes. patients cannot receive primary PCI, it is a, it's a fantastic strategy that you will give us uh, the latest generations of allergic therapy and then ship him or you know either straight immediately or later on to a PCI capable hospital. So I think pharmacoinvasive therapy should be a strategy of choice uh, in developing countries or in, in situations where there is a huge uh, expense in terms of uh, ge geographic uh, distribution as well as uh, uh, proximity issue. So I, I completely agree with you. Even in Singapore, actually not everybody get primary PCI uh, following uh, AMI. Uh, we realize that only about maybe about 70% of patients with STEMI receive primary PCI. 30% of patients still come in very late after more than 12 hours after the onset of their symptoms, in which case they miss the window for primary PCI and then uh, oftentimes there will be significant uh, myocardial damage as a result. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, once, again, once again, I am uh, asking you, uh, you have shown in your data also that multivessel PCI uh, versus culprit lesion PCI and multivessel PCI is class 2 indication for primary PCI. And yes, sometimes we see this type of scenario, acute ST elevation, myocardial infarction, inferior, RC is total occluded. Simultaneously, we are seeing that LED is 99% with TIMI impaired uh, flow. Uh, zero to two. To me, then in this case, whether shall we go for um, uh, LED as well as with RC? Sir, I think this uh, in these situations, then you should really go ahead and do 
the uh, PCI of the other non culprit uh, lesions because there's yes. clear ischemia going on, and there's clear uh, impairment of flow, and obviously this is not going to be good in the patients with a myocardial infarction. The multi vessel strategy refers to a somewhat stable lesion stuff. People who are not having a acute impairment of flow that you can clearly see. And then you can decide whether to do it immediately or late on. So I think that applies more. Not your kind of situation where sometimes we see there is simultaneous occlusion of several arteries in the same patients with acute myocardial infarction, probably uh, as a result of a systemic inflammatory uh, process. So your kind of scenario, you should go and deal with it right away. Hopefully it's not too complicated. Thank you, because we have got a better experience that in the acutomous ST lesion market and function inferior, we have done the RCP, PCA, and at that time there was a critical lesion in the LED and with uh, impairment of flow. And uh, we waited for 24 hours at night, he developed uh, acute market and function entry. So I think it should be done, and it depends on case to case. According to the case, we can uh, take the decision whether we does the non culprit lesion or not. This is the uh, comment, I think. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ten. Leave it us. Uh, we go for the next session. Dr. Ten, uh, thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, Dr. Osnomad. Goodbye, everybody. We go for, forward, moving for the second session. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the department. Uh, take the microphone. Thank you all.